Bagnold learns of the loss of Clayton on the 1st of February 1941, and learns of the disastrous engagement with the Italian Auto Saharan Company the next day. Five men had been killed, three wounded, and three captured. Four of the dead men were from Moore's party, who would have their own epic journey to complete, but this is unknown to Bagnold, who feels deeply troubled by their loss. Equally concerning, Clayton's papers and cipher are also captured. On the 3rd of February, the Italians use the cipher to send a series of bogus messages to the Long Range Desert Group, which just raised smiles in the group, but concerned Bagnold nonetheless. The good news is that by this point, O'Connor's Western Desert Force has advanced 500 miles, beaten the Italian 10th Army, and has captured scores of prisoners, equipment, and material. The British are now at El Aguila, and despite the fact that there is little opposition left, and that O'Connor wants to go all the way and throw the Italians out of North Africa for good, Churchill thinks otherwise. Churchill orders Wavell to stop the advance and transfer the bulk of his forces to Greece. This leaves Neem in charge of the now weakened British force at El Aguila. General Wavell commiserates Bagnold over the loss of Clayton, and to raise his spirits, asks him to write about the Long Range Desert Group for the newspapers. Britain, suffering under the Blitz, needs a morale boost. A few days later, Bagnold's account appears in the newspapers, and is an instant hit. The BBC also gets involved, and the Long Range Desert Group become the most famous and most romantic unit of the North African campaign. They became instantly recognisable, as the BBC showed them in their Arab headdress, even though they only wore them during a sandstorm or used them as a dishcloth. Once the cameras are gone, they revert to their cap comforter. Bagnall and a few others also appear on the radio in New Zealand. One of the New Zealanders' soldiers reassures everyone at home that he has plenty of rum to drink. But despite this publicity, there's no getting around the fact that the Long Range Desert Group had suffered a serious blow. Clayton is gone, and Bagnold has to find a replacement. On the 16th of February, Guy Prendergast comes from England to join Bagnold as his second in command, and a proper group HQ is organised. A general reorganisation of the Long Range Desert Group takes place, and it now consists of two squadrons. Steele's B Squadron is formed using the New Zealand patrols. After the success of the Mazuk operation, New Zealand General Freyberg decides that the New Zealand patrols can remain with the Long Range Desert Group, and that they should be kept up to full strength. T and R patrols are therefore saved, and are now under Steele's command. Mitford's A Squadron receives G Patrol, and the newly formed S Patrol, named after the Southern Rhodesians, who formed its ranks. This is created at the end of January 1941, and Mitford also receives Y Patrol, which comes into being on the 25th of February 1941. This is under the command of Pat McCraith. Called Y Patrol because it was drawn from the Omanuri regiments of the 1st Cavalry Division, this patrol has a rough beginning. The 1st Cavalry Division had been sent from England to Palestine, complete with their horses, and were neither use nor ornament there. The men sent to Bagnold were so bad that Bagnold sent 24 of the 32 recruits back to their regiments. Bad characters. They had been sent by their units just to get rid of them, and were simply unsuitable for the task. Their units wanted rid of them, and so did Bagnold, but eight were taken on. What the Long Range Desert Group lacked most was skilled navigators. Luckily for Bagnold, one of the eight was the man for the job. A self-taught but skilled navigator, Lofty Carr, had to be escorted from his previous unit, as the commanding officer wasn't willing to give Carr a helping hand. Outspoken and intelligent, Carr had antagonised his officers because they treated the war as if they were out on a North Staffordshire hunt. Carr's prowess in navigation and his known reputation in the Staffordshire Yeomanry made him the ideal candidate, and because of his height and intelligence, he soon earned the nickname Lofty. Lofty Carr will go on to be an important character later, but for now, 
he had to learn the ropes. The eight new recruits were nicknamed Bagnall's Blue-Eyed Boys by their new officer, Captain McCraith, and were told to forget everything they learned up to now because they weren't in the regular army anymore. When one appears on parade in full riding breeches and shiny boots, McCraith looks the soldier up and down in mocking silence before telling him to go and get changed. McCraith had to go off in search of more men with the qualities that impressed Bagnold. Eventually, by March 1941, Y Patrol has its full complement of 32 men. Bagnold doesn't want thugs. He wants ordinary men with the right frame of mind for the job. And that's exactly what he got. Another of the men enrolled at this point was Trooper Cave, who we'll come back to shortly. In addition to the manpower changes, most of the 30 hundred weight Chevrolet trucks were worn out after traveling thousands of miles in the desert. It's unprofitable to waste time repairing them, so they have to be replaced. But there simply wasn't the option to replace them like for like, and there was nothing in the desert except the new Ford 30 hundred weight four wheel drive trucks. 70 of these new trucks are given to the Long Range Desert Group in February, and it takes nearly a month of modification before they're considered desert worthy. The new paint camouflage includes the colour pink, which is effective at dawn and dusk as it blends in with the haze from the sun. Bagnold isn't impressed by the new trucks though. Not only would there be complications because of the four wheel drive, but their greater weight is also of concern. The men also prefer the Chevrolets because they're easier to handle and because they have a bonnet. With the Fords, the men get a blast of hot air in the face as they're driving, making it an uncomfortable drive. While the Long Range Desert Group is being reorganised and re-equipped, important events are happening in the south. General Leclerc advances on Kufra, and the Italian Order's Saharan Company decides to flee. The Italians in the fort continue to hold on for a little while longer, but on the 1st of March, 10 years and 40 days after they first occupied the Libyan oasis, the Italians are thrown out of Kufra. Kufra surrenders to the Free French. 64 Italians and 650 Libyans, together with large quantities of arms and ammunition, fall into French hands. Leclerc's capture of Kufra is to be a great boon for the Long Range Desert Group, who use it in the following two years as a base and forward supply point. Bagnold is made commander of the Kufra garrison. In order to ensure its safety, B Squadron has to be used on static observation duties at Tazerbo and Zigen. But the main issue for the Long Range Desert Group in Kufra is the lack of fuel. It's 800 miles from Cairo, across the desert. So by the end of the journey, there is little fuel left to supply the patrols who were needing it so badly. Therefore, the Long Range Desert Group at Kufra spent much of the summer months on garrison duty and protecting Kufra, as there were no other troops to do this. And they focused on keeping themselves supplied with petrol and rations, as well as training. But Mitford's A Squadron, with G and Y patrols, are kept busy at their base in Siwa. They keep an eye on the country to the south of the Jebel Akhtar, which is the fertile hilly area of Cyrenica, but in April the situation changes. As a consequence of Italian failure in North Africa, Hitler sends a new force to help out his ally. In late February 1941, Rommel and his new 5th Light Division arrives in Libya, and in early April, Rommel disobeys his orders and attacks. Mitford operates in a close reconnaissance role during the enemy advance. A Squadron is ordered to Bars. When Rommel attacks, Mitford leads Bars on the 1st of April, heading south to Massos. Unfortunately, half of Crichton Stewart's G Patrol, including Crichton Stewart himself, become cut off from the rest of the squadron. Unable to raise Mitford on the wireless, their only source of information comes from the BBC on the radio. Crichton Stewart listens to the announcer, who becomes ominously vaguer as time goes on. After the fall of Agadabia, the announcer only refers to the situation as fluid. Mitford's portion are around 10 miles from Massos when they spot a number of vehicles coming their way. Lofty Car recalls McCraith, giving them a talk earlier on that they weren't in the cavalry anymore and they weren't to charge the enemy. But when they spot six trucks coming towards them, 
McCrave immediately shouts, Charge! The enemy vehicles turn and flee, and the long range desert group give chase. Firing their Vickers and Lewis guns, they can't hear McCrave screaming, Stop! as they drive past little red flags in the sand. McCrave is stood up, waving his arms as his car takes off into the air and crashes down, having hit an AR 4 Italian mine. The AR 4 mine is nicknamed a thermos bomb by the British troops because it looks like a thermos flask. Luckily, the only harm to the truck is a blown tyre. However, McCrave breaks his arm and his hand in several places and knocks out his teeth. Worse, that night, Mitford calls Sirenica command and is informed that the vehicles they chased belonged to an Indian cavalry regiment. So McCrave loses his teeth for nothing. The next day, Mitford leads his men to Massus, currently held by the Free French, and evacuates McCrave. Mitford places Gibbs in command of Y Patrol, which Y Patrol aren't particularly happy with as they don't like traditional British officers like Gibbs. Gibbs won't make small talk with his men and earned no respect from them. On the 4th of April, Mitford moves the squadron southeast and they camp for the night about 80 miles east of Massos. The next day, they move north towards Machili. During these moves, they spot no sign of enemy ground troops, even though German and Italian forces were moving through Massos towards Chile. By the evening of the 5th, Mitford loses contact with Serenica command and his last order is to move the squadron to Machili. So Mitford does as instructed. At Machili, he places himself under the command of the brigadier in charge of the Indian Motorized Brigade. The Indians are defending the town from a force of Italians attacking from the south. Finally, in the late afternoon of the 5th of April, Crichton Stewart makes contact with Mitford, who says he's at Machili and surrounded by the enemy. He advises Crichton Stewart to head to Jarabub. Dismayed by the news, Crichton Stewart faithfully heads towards Jarabub, leaving Mitford to his fate. Mitford is ordered to attack the enemy on their western flank. He splits the squadron and goes off hunting. Mitford captures an Italian officer, while Gibbs skirmishes with an enemy HQ. During this period, one of the trucks is disabled by a stone that damages the radiator. Lofty Car and Trooper Cave drive the truck to Machili, and Trooper Cave stays with it while it's being repaired in the workshops of the Italian Motorized Brigade. As Cave waits, Lofty and the rest of the unit meet up again on the night of the 6th of April, four miles southwest of Machili. One of the men spots a tank in the distance. Their boy's anti-tank rifle isn't very effective over 100 yards, but they decide to give it a try anyway. Firing two shots, the enemy responds by firing a shell back at them. Thankfully, it misses. Mitford continues communication with the Brigadier inside Machili and agrees to continue harassing the Italian flanks. Throughout the 7th of April, the squadron skirmishes with the Italians and at one point opens fire on a 40 strong column of German vehicles. Two enemy trucks are knocked out and four prisoners taken. Having earned some success, that evening the squadron camp six miles west of Machili. At 0600 hours on April 8th, the Germans attack Machili in force and overwhelm the Allied forces there. Trooper Cave, as well as 1,500 other Allied troops, are taken prisoner. Cave vows to escape, but there's little he can do for the time being. Some of the men offer to go rescue Cave, but Mitford dismisses the attempt and decides to withdraw. Using the terrain and aided by a sudden sandstorm, A Squadron withdraw east, and by the evening of the 8th, they were 40 miles east of Machili. Here, they find a column of German artillery in 50 vehicles camped in a depression. Early next morning, A Squadron creeps up behind a ridge and gets behind the Germans. With the German guns facing the wrong way, Mitford signals with his hand and the Long Range Desert Group opens fire. In a short, sharp engagement, they obliterate the Germans and flee the scene. Crichton Stewart arrives at Jarabub on the morning of the 10th of April. The French officer there treats the patrol to a lavish meal, but just after they finish eating, the alarm is sounded. The patrol seize their weapons and rush to the battlements, as though they're in a western film. They prepare to fire on the vehicles approaching from the north. Crichton Stewart peers through his binoculars and, in the nick of time, identifies them. It's Mitford. 
who arrives with Y Patrol and the other half of G Patrol. Reunited, they spend two days at Jerobub, and here they rest before they head off east to Siwa, knowing they did all they could to hurt the Germans. They get a nice surprise. At Siwa, they meet back up with Trooper Cave. He has escaped and walked over 200 miles through the desert to safety. The Long Range Desert Group is really the only success story of this period of the Western Desert Campaign, apart from maybe the Siege of Tobruk. If you haven't seen my video on Rommel's first desert offensive, you'll find the links on the screen or in the description below. Thanks for watching, bye for now.